1 Corinthians chapter 15, where I'm going to get my main text, and then from that we'll go off into 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13, the end of the chapter. It is Memorial Day, isn't it? And uh, what's Memorial Day? Well, to people around here, it's a big race. There's probably 250 to 300,000 people going to be down in Indianapolis to see, to see them run a race. I think it's one of the biggest sporting events in the world. And uh, so, but Memorial Day, really, and some people call it Decoration Day. That's actually Monday, though, isn't it? And of course, Carol and I usually go around to the cemeteries. Of course, my dad would tell you, don't come down here to my grave. I'm not there. Just my body's there. That's what he'll do. That's what I, I can hear him tell me. Has he ever told us that? And so don't spend a lot of time down here. But we still go down and put some flowers on his grave. And, but Memorial Day, too. You know, there's people that have died for other people besides Jesus. Yes. If some hadn't fought in wars, we wouldn't be sitting here with the freedoms we have this morning. Yeah. And so I'd be thankful for people that have done that. Some have died doing it. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, in our family, we didn't have anybody die from it. But we had quite a few of them fight in the wars. My brother, my dad, several uncles, and uh, but we ought to honor people like that. They had that school shooting down there in Texas. Some of the teachers died trying to protect the kids. That's a, that's a wonderful thing that somebody loves somebody enough to do that. And I'm thankful for people like that. We ought to honor people like that. Of course, there's scripture that we could uh, go to in the Gospel of John, different places. Of course, the ultimate one that laid down his life for us, but he could take it again, was Jesus. Amen. And so if we go to the Gospel of John, we can find some scripture there. Like I say, that's not my main text that I want to go to this morning, but... We're going to go through 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but uh, in the Gospel of John, there's verses there, uh, I think 9th, 10th chapter of John, that we can get, look at. And uh, so, John chapter uh, 10 and 9 and 10. He said his father loved him because he laid down his life. And he said, how much more love can you have than to lay down your life for somebody? And uh, talks to, about us. Isn't that what Jesus did for us on the cross? Mm -hmm. But he said, I lay down my life, but I can take it again. That just a normal man couldn't say that. He was God in flesh. But he took on flesh. You know, next week I'm thinking about preaching it. Well, I won't be preaching next week. Probably have to be the week after that. <laughs> about a personal relationship with God. Amen. If you don't have a personal relationship with God, you're in bad trouble. And I, I don't want a God that's off out somewhere out there that's just some force. Or I need somebody I can talk to. That I can relate to that I, I can talk to God and God can talk to me. You ever talk to God? Does He ever talk to you? Well, somebody says, well, I don't know. I didn't hear a voice. But the Bible says His Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. And then when you do read the Bible, isn't that God speaking to you? And when you pray, aren't you talking to God? Sometimes, you know, you don't even have to say it out loud. God knows what you think. 
They just think things. God knows it. Amen. And God cares enough about you, you know, but said, how much greater love can you have? But there have been people lay down their lives for other people. Just like those school teachers, there's been people in the military do that. We want to be thankful that people love others enough to do that. Most of all, we ought to be thankful that Jesus loved us enough to do it for us. It means a different difference in heaven and hell. Doesn't it? If He hadn't done that, we'd all be on our way to hell. But He made a way for us to go to heaven. And so this morning, like I say, I had uh, some verses I wanted to look at. I, I got a lot of notes. I maybe spent too much time visiting with our family yesterday, not enough time trying to get this together. But uh, there's uh, this 15th chapter. Of course, what's the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians deal with? Resurrection. The resurrection. Amen. And uh, it's really, we probably learn more about the body we're going to have in the future than about any other single place in all the Bible. Yeah, that's true. You can learn a lot from John, the Gospel of John, because it shows uh, things from God's viewpoint and uh, instead of man's viewpoint so much like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I think it represents more how God feels about it and how He loves us and cares about us. If you're going to recommend somebody to read one book in the Bible, I'd recommend John. Right. Amen. Because that's probably the clearest cut place you can go to know about salvation. And so we're going to go, first of all, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to go down to about verse 50. But I'm not going to read 50 right now. I'm going to read 51 and then come back and read 50. I think it fits that way better. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Are you going to be changed? Now, if you're not saved. That's right. You won't get that new body if you don't get saved. You'll be stuck with this one. Right. <laughs> well, that's a bad thought right there in itself. I like to have that new body, wouldn't you? Yeah. And so we look at this as, Behold, I show you a mystery. A mystery. Anybody ever read mysteries? Mm -hmm. But I don't think mystery. Here's something so strange that nobody can understand it. You know, there's some mysteries in the Bible. You know, in the Old Testament, the church was a mystery. Right. You don't know uh, what, you know, we just read about Israel and all those things, but it doesn't, until you get to the New Testament, it doesn't really explain the church and how Jesus loved the church and died for it and how the church is His bride and He's the bridegroom and uh, it doesn't, we don't learn all those things. Also, it compares the human marriage relationship to the relationship we have to God or to Jesus. It's, or the bride, he's the bridegroom. And so we learn those things. Uh, the mystery here, though, he's talking about is this change. It'd be the rapture. I'm going to change on the way up. Are you going to change on the way up? Even the ones, all, all the Christians will change. Every one of them. They'll get a new, better body than they've ever had before. Now, I like that thought myself as I've gotten older. I like it more. He says, Behold, I show you, Miss, we shall not all be asleep, but we shall all be changed. The only part of you that would ever sleep as a Christian is your body. Your soul and spirit says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Soul and spirit leaves the instant you die and goes to be with God in heaven, but they put your body in the ground. And it'll stay there. But eventually, you know, all the people that are, your loved ones that have already died, they've buried them over the years. They're going to come up out of the grave. There's going to be a generation that's alive when Jesus comes. I wouldn't mind being in that much. I kind of keep, want to keep looking up. I'm ready to go. You're ready to go. Now, if you're not saved, you're not initiated into God's 
church and into his family. Of course, you get into the church, you know, different ways you can define church. It's called out assembly. Is God going to call a bunch of us out of here one of these days and take us to heaven? Yes, sir. But we were called out this morning to come here to the local church. Amen. Then we refer to the body of Christ. Well, we don't like talking about the uh, invisible universal church, but that's kind of like the body of Christ, isn't it? Are you the finger, the big toe? Or are you the heart, the head? Uh, the head is Jesus. I know that part. Amen. I just don't know what part I am. But I'm... I'm a part of the body of Christ because I'm saved. And if you're saved, you're a part of the body of Christ. Then, do the parts of your body help you to get something done? Could you do anything without the parts of your body? Well, you know, my fingers are getting numb anymore. It's hard for me to turn my pages and stuff and fasten buttons. I wouldn't think that was very important until you start losing it. Exactly. Then it gets real important. The least person in our church, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you study the body of Christ there, is important. Amen. Matter of fact, the ones that we think are the least important are probably some of the more important ones. We ought to go out of our way to help them. Another thing, we don't get to pick what part we do in the body. We just, God picks what He wants us to do. But you need to be willing to do what God wants you to do in the body of Christ. And somebody, the best we can see is the local church. We need people here in this church to do things for God. If we don't have people in the church doing things for God, we won't have a church very long. One thing, if you didn't do, come to church this morning, there wouldn't be a church here. It's not this building. The church is you. Amen. Aren't you the church? Yes. And I'm glad people have been faithful, faithful coming to church. He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Now, I, I, we're going to come back here, but right now go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Go to verse 13 to the end of the chapter and it describes the change. It describes the change. Part of it. What's going to actually happen overall. But then I think in order to know what kind of a body you're going to have in the future, you'd probably have to go study about Jesus' body after He rose from the dead. Amen. He ate mm -hmm. after He rose from the dead. I kind of like that. I still get to eat. Huh? Amen. But he can, I think, walk through walls. He just appears in a room. Now, I can't understand that. I can't walk through this pulpit. But I might be able to one day. I don't know. I, you know, the Bible doesn't give us all the minute details. But we could study Jesus after the resurrection because He had a body. When He comes back, He's going to be in a body. But His body will have nail prints and scars. And the Bible teachers will know each other in heaven. Dr. McGee says, well, if you're married down here, will you be married in heaven? Dr. McGee says, probably depends on whether you want to be. I don't know about that. That's just what he says. First Thessalonians chapter 4, let's go down to verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant. Well, mystery, you know, that you might be ignorant if you don't know the mystery. How do you know the mystery? You read your Bible. Amen. And we learn about these mysteries in the Bible. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Now he's talking to Christians. Are you brethren? Brothers and sisters in the Lord? Concerning them which are asleep. Do you have some loved ones that were Christians that have died? Well, they look like they're asleep. Their body's asleep, but their soul and spirit went on to be with the Lord. First Corinthians chapter 5, it teaches of that. That ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. We have hope. We're going to be with our loved ones again. That's my hope. Is that your hope? 
He goes on in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. Now their soul and spirit went on to heaven. He's going to come back with their soul and spirit. Then their body is going to come up out of the ground if they're already dead. We, if we're still alive, Paul uses we. I don't know. He would probably like to have still been alive. I don't know. I'd like to still be alive myself. I think he's just meeting all the Christians. And he says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He'll bring our souls and spirits back, whether we're dead or alive at that time. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So are their bodies going to come up out of the ground? Are you going to go up if you're still alive? When I go up ahead of them, I think we'll all get together and go up together. We won't, we won't go ahead of them because we're six foot ahead of them. Well, they usually bury you six foot down. Though. That's what I always say. I don't know. I never did measure it. Some of them, they put crypts and yeah. shells and stuff and drawers. We've seen a few of those, haven't we, Carol? Brother Hurd, I think they did that. Did they do that with Lois? My mom and dad, they put in the ground. Their body... Not the real them. That's just the shell that their soul and spirit lived in. And he goes on, he says, uh, verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we shall not, uh, uh, which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The dead ones come out. They're six foot behind, so they got to come up. <laughs> then we go again. That's the idea there, isn't it? Amen. At least that's what I get out of it. What do you get out of it? You need to get it out of it, not me. Amen. Well, I got it out of it for me, but you need to get it out of it for you. Isn't that the way it works? You need to believe this stuff. Won't do you. It won't do you much good for me to believe it for I can't believe it for you. You've got to believe it for yourself. Verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Together with them. Right? So it says, And the clouds will meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we what? Ever be with the Lord. Well, wouldn't that be something? You know, in John 14, it says, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be. Also, he's getting a spot. must be quite a place because he spent a long time getting it ready. But he's getting it ready. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Does it help you to believe that you're going to see your loved ones again? Does it help you to believe you're going to go up? Yes. Helps me. Is that a comfort to us? Yes. Now let's go back over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 again. And we read, Behold, I show you a mystery. The mysteries were going up. Yeah. But the church is a mystery too. But it doesn't talk about it. talks about that in Ephesians too, I believe. It's in Ephesians. It talks about the church. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Are you going to change on the way up and get that new body? Your soul and spirit going to be put back in the new body? A better body than you've ever had. Think that's way. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, that's not the last of the series in the seven trumps in the book of Revelation. That's right. We're not going through the tribulation. We're going up before it. But some take that and try to make you going through it or part way through it. But here it says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Is that pretty fast? How fast is the speed of light? 186,000 miles per second or something. Is that right or not? Pretty close. To they say it that way. Well, I think they say it varies, that they think it's uh, changing. 
course, I'm not scientific, so, you know, I, I was a social science major, not a science major. I did study the Bible a little bit, though. It says, in the moment and twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead in, uh, shall be raised incorruptible. Are you corruptible now? Are you going to rot? Well, we don't want to think about that. Nancy tested blood, didn't you, Nancy? Yeah. We also cannot. Now let's go back up. I skipped that one verse. Let's go back to that. Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit, um, inherit incorruption. I'm not going to have a body that can die again. Amen. I'm not going to be corrupted. I'm corrupted down here. Of course, a lot of people, they don't want to say they're corrupted. They don't sin. They don't do anything wrong. Amazes me. Some of the things that they come up with. Joe, would you go turn the air conditioner where it won't come on? Uh, I think it just cycled. Um, but anyway, we're going to have this incorruptible body and uh, we shall be changed for the corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on what? Immortality. We don't have to go to the mortuary when we die. Amen. There won't be any graveyards. I don't even think there'll be hospitals. That's right. But I do believe that you can eat fruit off of trees. It'll help you stay healthy teaches that over in the book of Revelation. But now I could get into a big discussion. Is that during the millennium or is that during the eternity or is it during both? <laughs> now you find, figure all that out and you come back and let me know. <laughs> huh? Stay that out. Doesn't matter to me. It's going to get better. Amen. Does anybody think it needs to get better? Amen. I sure do. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. The sermon, if you want a title, Victory Over Death. Amen. Who was the first one to really get victory over death? Jesus. Jesus. He said, I can... I uh, lay down my life in the Gospel of John. He said, I can take it up again. And he never laid it down again. And one of these days, he's going to come back. That's right. Then he's going to give, well, well, I have eternal life now as far as my soul and spirit. It's just my body they're going to put in the ground. But then it's going to be made better than it ever was eventually. Put back with my soul and spirit. Somebody says, where do you get that? Just from studying the Bible. Now I want to you, give you something Sigmund Freud said. Anybody know who he was? Yeah, Father of modern psychology. Yeah. He's a wacko. <laughs> Amen. I took general psych, educational psych, applied psych. I never did uh, take abnormal. I've thought about that. Dr. McGee said he took it. And he said, uh, as they had studied through that, he kind of could see himself in different abnormalities. <laughs> so after the class was over, he finally, after a period of time, went back to talk to the professor. He's concerned, you know, maybe there's, maybe I'm abnormal. <laughs> well, the whole world thinks, oh, you are abnormal. That's You're in church true. this morning. Why aren't you down at the race? Yeah. yeah. Partying. That's what, the, most of them down there are down there to party, not to watch the race. Get drunk and do crazy things. But anyway. But anyway, I was going to read this thing about Sigmund Freud, the father of modern psychology. I think I got that written here. He says, uh, Sigmund Freud, and finally, there is the painful riddle of death. Is the death a riddle to you? Or do you know what's going to happen? Well, did you read in a psychology book? Yeah, no clue. Did you read in a science book? 
Well, some people I might have read in a comic book. <laughs> Only it's not funny. But anyway, he says, and finally, this is the painful riddle of death for which no remedy at all has yet been found. Do you have a remedy for death? Amen. Trust Jesus. That's right. Isn't that the remedy for death? Uh, do you know any other remedy? Nope. Well, I don't know. I take handfuls of pills. And I'm still dying. Carol, they cut her open and worked on her heart. She's still dying. Now they might make her live, a, help her to live a little bit longer. That's true. But eventually she's going to die if Jesus doesn't come back. But I'm looking. Amen. Huh? Now Casey and Lily here, they're young. They say, oh, we, we, we haven't been married too long. We'd like to have a family and get a house and... Have, have a lot of the nice things, you know, of life. I, you know, when I was younger, I thought that way too, pretty much. And didn't we all? Yes. And has God brought us this far? Yes, sir. And everything you have above nothing, you ought to thank God for it. Amen. That's true. Every good gift, perfect gift coming down from the Father of lights, I think that's the first part of James. Amen. But... We look at these things. I have finished Freud's statement here. We'll finish that up. He said, and finally there is this painful riddle of death for which no remedy at all has yet been found nor probably ever will be. Huh. Now, that's the guy that's going to help you when you got emotional and mental problems. I think he had more emotional... You know, a lot of these people that are counselors, I think, have more problems than the people they counsel. Yeah, and then they charge you a bunch of money for their advice. Which is probably bad advice. <laughs> if they don't know what's going to happen when they die, you know, I don't know. But have we learned anything so far from 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Amen. Now, what verse are we getting down to? We got through the incorruptible and the corruptible and the mortal and the immortal. And so we're on down here. Well, I'm moving right along. Because to the end of the chapter is only 58 verses and I'm already up to uh, 55. Three more verses. And the preach is going to be done. <laughs> How do you believe that? you believe that? Uh, oh, death, where is thy sting? You know, if a bee stings you, a wasp stings you, and once the stinger's out, he can't sting you again. The stinger's in Jesus for Christians. Can't sting you again. But some little kids, Lord, let me play with that bee. I just want to play with the bee. Oh no, get away from that. Well, a lot of people want to play with sin. Will it sting you? Better not play with it. It's dangerous. Sin and the law and death all go together. Sin, law, and the death all fit together. They kind of help each other out. But in this verse, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? I'm not staying in the grave. Jesus didn't stay in the grave, and he said, I don't have to either. Then why should I believe him? Why should I believe Jesus? Amen. He's not in the grave. Amen. He's going to come back again. I'm looking for him any time. Somebody says, Oh, I don't know it. It's been all these years, they go over to Peter and say, well, you've been saying that and saying that and saying that. And we have. It's been a long time. But to God, it's just been a little while. Amen. To us, it's been a long time. He goes on, verse 56, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. See, they're all connected. How do you know when you do anything wrong? Well, the law. But if you're trying to keep the law to get to heaven, you'll never make it. Because we all sin. 
Anybody here never sin? I better be careful. Somebody raise their hand. <laughs> well, in society today, it's likely. But how do they know what sin is? How do you know what sin is? Well, we'll watch TV and see what they say it is. We'll listen to the politicians. Most of the politicians are deep into sins themselves. You know, the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money. The love of it. If it controls you instead of you controlling it. Amen. Then the Bible says contentment is a great gain. A lot of this is in Ecclesiastes and Proverbs where you get a lot of these things. The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. How do I know when I've sinned? Well, if I break God's law. Most people don't even know what God's law is. It's all right to abort babies. Think God says that's all right? No, sir. says, thou shalt not kill. Yeah. Well, that baby's not really a baby. Mm -hmm. Then I get into big arguments over when it becomes a baby. From conception. Amen. Verse 57, But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Where we get the victory from? Savior. Read your Bible and read about Jesus and believe what it says. And I think you'll get the victory. Amen. And there are several things we could say. Uh, we're down here to the 58th verse now. And so I wanted to talk about it a little bit. Uh, verse 58. I think I had a few other notes I might want to throw in here. See what I've got. i got all kinds of stuff written down here. Well, do we have to undergo a, a glorious change? Are you planning on undergoing a glorious change? On the way up? Yep. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye? Amen. Well, that Musk guy's shooting people up there in rockets now. <laughs> They're not getting near to God, though. They're not even getting out of the second, uh, second uh, heaven. God's in the third heaven. Somebody says, where do you find that? In the Bible, Paul talks about it. But we're going to have to, we're going to go, you know, this body that we've got now, isn't built for the new creation. It's not built for it. It has to be changed. And I, I read that one verse to you. I, I left it. Verse uh, 15, verse 50. Now this I see then, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You're not going to have a body exactly like this one. But then we can start studying Jesus' body after He rose from the dead. And there, there are several things I had down here I was going to talk about with that before I even got to that uh, 58th verse. Got to find the right page with notes on it here. I know I've got, there is one right there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The lost man can't understand a lot of this. Some Christians don't understand a lot of it. Unfortunately. And uh, we, we could go through, uh, you know, a fellow named Peter. Anybody ever heard of Peter? In Matthew chapter 16, verse 23, say, Jesus had done, Get thee behind me, Satan. Was Peter a Christian? Did he believe in Jesus? Did he followed him around for three years, didn't he? And uh, one time he said, They asked uh, who Jesus was, and he said he was the Son of God. And the Lord said, That's good. I said, God told him that. But then Satan was working on him too. Does Satan work on you? Yes, sir. But yet God works on us. And then later on, Peter denied Christ three times. Jesus comes along. He says, asked Peter, said, do you love me? Peter said, well, yes, I love you. Do you love me? 
Yes, I love you. He, he finally gets into the third time. Peter says, well, you know I love you. But he didn't want to mess up again. Can the Lord change our hearts? If you're saved, does He change your heart? Yes. I think you even get a heart transplant. Amen. I think God knew about heart transplants way before the doctors could do it. But God could do it. Then Paul, uh, Paul was preaching to a guy named Agrippa. Anybody know what he was talking to? Agrippa was one of the leaders. And uh, Paul was told when he got saved, he'd probably appear before some kings and high official people. We need some, somebody to appear to some of those politicians in Washington. Some of them need to get straightened out. Amen. They need to get right with God. Don't they? But don't some of us? But anyway, in Acts chapter 26, verse 28, Paul's talking to Agrippa. He'd been given his testimony, telling him how he got saved. And Agrippa says, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. I think some people are almost saved, but almost isn't good enough. That's right. You've got to trust Jesus. Then a fellow named Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas. <clears throat> Why do we call him Doubting Thomas? Remember after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to the apostles? But Thomas wasn't there the first time. And he says, I'm not going to believe that. And they said, now Thomas, we, we saw Jesus. He said, I'm not going to believe unless I can see Him and put my fingers in the nail prints of His hands and in His side. Then, he said, I, I believe. Look at John chapter 20. Well, we're going to be back here to Corinthians for that last verse in a little while, but go to John chapter 20. We'll read about uh, Thomas here going the wrong direction. What does it, Brother Noble say? You turn left or right? <laughs> so I need to go left and what right? John chapter 20. And he's, this is after the, when, when Jesus appears to Thomas then, after Thomas had said, I'm, I'm not going to believe until I've put my fingers in your the wounds. And so Jesus appears to him. And I think this is where he just appears in the room. And he just appears in the room when the Apostles, but in John chapter 20, we'll go down here to uh, well, this, this Bible. I'll have the outline in it. So, <coughs> let's go down John chapter 20. Uh, go to verse 25. Uh, the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. We've seen Jesus. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the prints of the nails and put my fingers into the prints of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Well, you know, there's a lot of people like that. They want a sign. Maybe if somebody could speak in tongues or heal somebody, mm -hmm. jump enough pews, something, you know, maybe I'd believe. Jesus says there was only one miracle that I'm going to give you to prove that I'm who I says. And he says that's the resurrection. Amen. The resurrection. Do you believe it or don't you believe it? Is Jesus still laying in the ground? Or did he come out? And so Thomas is having trouble here. In verse 26, and after eight days again, his disciples were in the, uh, or within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut. How did he get in there if the door shut? Maybe he had a different kind of body. Well, it's uh, where we get these ideas from now, the Bible. He goes on, the doors being shut and stood in the midst of 
and said, Peace be unto you. Boy, I'd like for the Lord to come this way. Say, Peace be unto you. Amen. Of course, He'd have to come to do that. I guess that'd mean I'd be going up. He wouldn't come clear down, He'd just come to the clouds. <clears throat> I'd be caught up to meet Him together with others. Verse 27, Then saith He uh, uh, to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hands, and thrust it into my side, and he, and be not uh, faithless, but believing. And we need to believe. Then verse 28, And Dom, Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my no. God. Now, is he, he might be your God, is he your Lord? Well, you know, some people have what they call lordship salvation. If you're a Christian, you ought to just be doing everything right. Amen. Huh? Well, I don't think you're going to do everything right in this life. There's still a battle going on between the old and new nature. But Jesus is my Lord, but He was my Savior. He's both. If He's your Savior, shouldn't He be the Lord Amen. over your life? Shouldn't He have some control over your life? Well, some people, ah, it's all right for Him to be my Savior. I don't want Him being my Lord. Kind of weird. But that's the way some people are. We'll just put Him in the trunk in this, for a spare tire, and if we have flat, we'll drag Him out. Does it work that way? Or do you need Him all the time? And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, and Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, has be, uh, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believe, uh, believed, blessed are they that have not seen me, and yet have believed. That would be you guys. I didn't see him. I've seen him by faith. Anybody here seen him by faith? <clears throat> but you haven't seen him with your natural eye. But I'm going to. Amen. Are you planning on seeing him with your actual eyes? I wonder if we get to talk to Jesus in heaven. Well, if you don't talk to him now, you won't be talking to him in heaven. Does that make any sense? Maybe I start talking to him now. Then you have more to talk to him about when you get to heaven. Amen. But. I think these are good things. Then, afterwards, Jesus, Peter went back to fishing, remember? And uh, fished all night, didn't catch anything. John chapter 21. And uh, Jesus calls out to him. He's on the shore and he says, Have you caught anything? He said, All night they hadn't. Now, these are professional fishermen. And yeah, they know what they're doing. Didn't catch anything all night. Now go to John chapter 21. Go down to, uh, well, let's see, what verse we want to go to? Five, maybe? Let's look at five. Then I said, uh, Jesus saith unto them, Children, have you any meat? Did you catch any fish? No. Then they answer in the next verse. They answered him, No. <laughs> have you caught any fish? Well, have you ever led anybody to the Lord? Mm -hmm. That's catching fish, I believe. Amen. They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. So they do what he says to do, almost. <clears throat> they cast, therefore, and now they were not able to draw in for the multitude of fish. Therefore, that uh, disciple whom the Lord loves saith uh, unto Peter is the Lord. Recognize them. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisherman's coat unto him, for he was naked. Now, I think he just didn't have a shirt on. And did cast himself into the sea, and the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land. That's kind of like Peter, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. 
Was he impulsuous? But sometimes it got him in trouble. And sometimes God used him that way. He can use you however you are. And he has a purpose and a plan for every one of us and we're all different. The thing is, we need to be asking God, what do you want me to do? I'm going to get into that. we got one more verse there in the 15th chapter. But as it were 200 cubits dragging the nets with fish, as soon as they uh, were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals uh, there, and a fish laid thereupon, thereon, and bread. Jesus must have been a Baptist. <laughs> They have a pitch-in dinner. <laughs> Only he did all the pitching. He fed a multitude, didn't he? 4,000 one time, 5,000 another time. Has he fed any of you? Yes, sir. Spiritually. Well, it could be spiritually and physically. Now, verse 10, Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land. But... Apparently, Jesus ate after in his new body. Amen. Trying to find out some more about his body. If you want to study that more, go through that 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15. And I've got a verse here to finish off. I think we're about down to the last verse, aren't we? Yes, sir. 58. If I have a life verse... That's my life verse. I don't have much to claim. But so far, the Lord's helped me to just stay in there and keep on keeping on. And to be honest with you, it's not getting easier. As I've gotten older, it's gotten harder. But I sure don't want to... I want to be able to get to the end and say, I fought a good fight, I've kept the faith. Like Paul was able to... But I can only do that if when God tries to lead me, I yield. I need to just keep yielding to God. And He'll get me to the next time. Then I'll need to yield again. Isn't that the way it works? Can't do it all at once. You just have to live it out. It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That doesn't mean I'm working my way to heaven, but I have to live it out. Now, I've been living it out for quite a while. What would it be? About 60 some years since I got saved. If I was saved at around 11 years old and I'm 76, it's a pretty good while. How much longer I've got it, I have no idea. I have no idea. But whatever I have, I want God to use it. So I need to keep yielding. He says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable. Now he's writing to these Corinthians, and they had all kinds of problems in their church. And Paul writes two letters trying to help them get straightened out. Maybe he needed to tell them, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. Find out what the, God wants you to do and stick with it. Unmovable, always abounding work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now there's two words here, work and labor. You know, work and labor are different words in the Greek. Well, they're different words in English. Work's more easy. Labor's hard. Is a, is, does that make any sense? Well, we can do some things for God. Boy, it's kind of fun. I enjoy it. But sometimes i got to go a little harder. What are you going to do when it gets hard? Are you going to labor? We need more laborers, don't we? We need workers and laborers. But we need to labor for the Lord. That way, sometimes <clears throat> might not be easy, but we just keep on going. I think that's important that we just keep on going.
And like I say, I don't have much to claim. And somebody would look at this church and say, this little building, this few people. But I can point to some people who've gotten saved. And that's what really makes it worth anything, is we've had people saved. But we need to have some more people saved, don't we? But we need to labor to get that done. The devil, he's going to make it hard on you. He's walking about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Okay, you, most of all of you have got to save, so <coughs> that part's settled. You're saved, you're going to go to heaven. But what he'll try to do after you get saved is he'll start trying to mess your testimony up in your life. He'll try to distract you and get you away from living for God. He'll try to get you off into sin. You know, you've got two natures after you get saved. Before you get saved, you just had one nature. There wasn't much of a battle. One guy says, well, the devil never bothers me. John R. Rice talked about that. John R. Rice says, well, it was a preacher who said that. He said, well, maybe you don't twist his tail. Somebody says, how do I twist his tail? You resist him. You live for God. You go to church, you read your Bible, you pray, you witness. You try to be separated from the world. Now that's a, that, that, that's a topic most people probably don't want to talk about. But we need to be separated. People ought to be able to see us and realize we're different than the world. Let's all stand. <clears throat>